Hey guys, I uh, guess it's time to get started here. I was wondering why there were so many people and then I realized because you haven't got your exam grades yet. Well, that's too bad because we're not quite done yet. Uh, but, you, but you will, uh, you'll get them soon. So your, your TAs have kindly uh, finished grading them and, and uh, now we have to do the usual arithmetic, post online, all that good stuff. Uh, let's see, in terms of course assignments, your last assignment is due tomorrow, yeah? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, how many of us have started? <laughs> Good. I see a few hands that aren't up. You are very brave individuals. Um, I think, judging from Piazza, it does appear that you guys are running into all the same problems that everybody runs into, which is that it's just, sorry, graphics programming is a big pain that took us, and like, <laughs> this is the, the worst it gets. Um, other than that, let's see, I need to get your project proposals graded, so my goal is to do that by the end of the week, and hopefully what I'll do is just send each of you an email one by one, uh, with a little bit of comments, not many, because there's a lot of you. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, so th basically your, your responsibility for the remainder of the course uh, is a nano quiz every other lecture, uh, your project check-in, which is, I forget when it's due, it's whatever's on the calendar, uh, and then the project uh, write-up and uh, presentation. One small note on the presentations, in the past offerings of this course we've had the presentations start in class and then go after the end of class. I have to catch a flight to Vancouver that night. So we'll probably have to do class and before class. Uh, like, and we're going to just have you guys sign up for slots. Uh, so anyway, just FYI, uh, we're going to have to do that. I'm going to ask you guys to be a little bit flexible uh, so that I can catch my flight. Uh, any questions about logistics? I think it's pretty easy in this class. OK, great. And yeah, of course, if you guys have questions about your exam, grading, you know, want to know how to answer that one question you were stuck on, or those eight questions you were stuck on, uh, just let me know, and I'm happy to talk through it, all that good stuff. Okay, so, uh, right, so let's see. So far in our class, we've, we've kind of moved through the graphics pipeline, right? We started with uh, splines and specifying 3D scenes, and we moved on to, uh, what, animation and, and that kind of stuff, and then to two different flavors of rendering. And now we enter the last phase of 6837, which is all the stuff that didn't fit anywhere else. Uh, so we'll have lots of kind of grab bag topics. Today's color, next time is hardware. Uh, I think we have one on like how displays work. Uh, and then usually this class, kind of traditionally the second to last lecture, we invite members of the graphics group here at MIT to come present some of their research and share what they're up to. Um, we're fortunate here at MIT that our graphics group is extremely diverse in terms of, of research interests. And not so diverse in terms of other axes. But, but that aside, the... Uh, uh, essentially, uh, you know, when we have people come and give talks, you'll see a really wide breadth of, of cool uh, topics that, that happen here uh, at MIT in graphics, which is pretty neat. And pretty representative of graphics as a discipline, which has left the, you know, core around rendering and now become this kind of field, which is basically defined by people that call themselves computer graphics researchers. It's a little unclear what it is beyond that. In any event, that's the rest of our class, which isn't terribly complicated. Um, uh, yeah, so without further ado, uh, let's get started with today's topic, which obviously is important for uh, graphics and displays and so on, uh, which is color. Uh, and, and this is a sort of an agglomerate. I can, I'm never quite happy with lectures in this area, largely because, you know, you, you've probably figured out by now I'm a math person and these kinds of messy things that involve like stuff inside of your eyeball really freak me out. But, uh, you know, we've converged on some semblance of a coherent story here and, and I'm happy to share it with all of you guys. So. Our plan for today is to talk a little bit about just what is color, um, and then more importantly, how do we perceive color, uh, which is not the same as what color is. Uh, in particular, um, we always talk about there being a giant spectrum of light, but we also talk about R, G, and B, and we should be a little bit careful about how we bridge that gap. Like, are there three colors, or are there a lot of colors? What does that mean? Um, we'll talk a bit about uh, sort of different color spaces and different color matching experiments that people do, like how do you, you replicate a given color on your computer screen, which is of course kind of a tricky matter and one that we rarely get absolutely right. Uh, and, and grab a lot of fun facts uh, along the way. Okay, so to get started for today, I think many of you guys have seen some version of this slide before in your lives. You probably many of you know much more about it than I do. Um, but of course, out in the world around us, what our eyeballs are sensing is the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and, uh, you know, as we sort uh, waves moving through space, we can do so in increasing wavelength or increasing frequency, which go in opposite directions from one another. And, of course, the visible uh, spectrum of light, which is basically what all this class is about, sits in this little itty-bitty piece of the spectrum here. 
right? And so really our, our, our lecture today is all about how do we perceive this little spectrum of, of visible light uh, and, and what does it mean uh, when we say that we see a particular color, yeah? And so uh, one thing that of course is worth noting, uh, you know, I think we, we tend to draw light as like a little sine wave that's like moving through space. Uh, but the reality is that light is a distribution over f wavelengths, or, or equivalently a distribution over frequencies, right? Meaning that like it's not just like one pure wavelength moving from your light source into your eye, but actually a big combination of different wavelengths. So there's, here's a sort of a typical plot that you see in this area where you, you know, sort by wavelength from blue to red, right? This is Roy G. Biv gone from right to left. Uh, and of course here we're describing a color of light which has some what, some blue in it, some red in it, and so on. And this plot here is, is called the, the spectrum, right? And it basically is saying for each wavelength, how much of that wavelength am I seeing in, in the light that I'm sensing? Okay, so, so let's think a little bit about uh, w what this means and, and its implications. And first of all, we can look at the spectrum of different things. So perhaps the simplest display technology out there is uh, crayons and, and indeed, uh, here's the spectral power distribution of, of different crayons in your Crayola box. Uh, and, and mostly the, the thing to, to kind of get out of this figure, like somehow, you know, the colors of crayons don't seem all that complicated, but actually there's really a lot going on even just in a box of crayons. And each one, the amount of light that is reflected off of these things is really a distribution. So a different way that I could understand these plots if it's more comfortable would be I could take a pure light source that only has one wavelength on it, bounce it off of my crayon and measure how much of it comes back, and that's sort of like the, the, the number that's coming up on this plot. So when we see color, uh, it's important to kind of understand that what we're seeing is like the composition of a bunch of physical processes, right? At the beginning, you know, there's just this idea of light, which is this distribution over wavelengths, and now that light starts bouncing off the of stuff, and that's what we see, right? And, and so let's think about what happens. So here's like a very 1980s kid holding an apple and cut out by Viktor Strimakov here. Um, I like his necklace, it's a good look. Uh, and he's holding an apple, the apple looks red. And the question is, why, why is that? Well, the first thing to realize is that it's not that the apple just emits <laughs> red light. We say a lot of really obvious things today and, and kind of think about them a little bit. But rather, the apple is reflecting light. So in particular, if I shined like a purely green light off the apple, I might not see anything at all, right? So it's not just property of the apple, it's a, it's a property of the environment around it. So indeed, Really what's going on is you have some light source somewhere, which is giving off electromagnetic waves. This thing has some distribution over nanometers, which is like the type of light that's, the types of frequencies that are contained inside of this light source. That hits the apple, which itself has its own reflectance spectrum, right? So this apple is saying that it mostly absorbs wavelengths up to about 600 nanometers, and then above 600 nanometers it tends to reflect them, for example. So then, what am I seeing? What bounces off of these things? Well, it's basically the product of these two functions. This is the, the spectral power distribution of what's coming into your eye. Does that make sense? So, so basically, uh, there's just like a giant multiplication that's going on. And, and of course, we all know that intuitively, right? Like if I change my lamp to some neon thing, neon lamps tend to have these kind of crazy spectral distributions that are like very peaked in, 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 in different places, right? Well now, of course, uh, our guy and our apple look kind of bluish. Uh, and that's just because that's really what's inside of our light source, right? It has nothing to do with the apple, you know? And so this is an interaction between material and uh, 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 light source, which is causing us to see what we see in our, our everyday life here. Okay, so, uh, right, so there's our, our basic setup. And, and of course, to make matters more complicated, I mean, so far, we've just talked about uh, our, our, our friend here and his apple and the light source, but of course, there's a third uh, person who's, who's gazing into this apple, which is Harry Potter apparently. Uh, and uh, really it's the interaction of these three characters in this story which are, are producing uh, the perceived image that we see, right? That, well, what's, what's going on? The light bounces off the apple. Those, those power distributions are multiplied together. Those are reflected to your eye. And then your eye has a sensor inside of it which is sensitive to different types of light. And somehow there's this magic thing that happens that all three of the players in this game get along and when they do, uh, you perceive color, right? And, and so this is the interaction between the color being present in your light source, the material of the object that you're looking at reflecting off that color that you're seeing, and then your eye being sensitive to that particular distribution of, of wavelength, right? So there's our, there's our story so far. 
So one way to think about it, let's, so let's start from the, 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 the kind of the inside back out here. Uh, in some sense, our, our client, our clientele when we're, when we're doing computer graphics is your eyeball, um, which actually as, as anatomy goes isn't terribly complicated, at least in this very schematic uh, view of the world. If you were wondering, I am not an anatomical expert. Uh, these images are stolen from Wikipedia because that's about all I understand about eyeballs. Uh, but in any event, here's, uh, here's your eye. And let's see what happens. So you have a wave, you know, some light waves coming into your eye. Goes through the lens and all the way into the back. In particular, it passes through a lot of different pieces, right? So first of all, it passes through the cornea, which is just a fixed focus lens, right? This is what's taking this wide angle view of the world and projecting it onto this very small opening here into your eye. Then it passes through the pupil and iris, right? Which is this adjustable opening, right? So if you go into a very bright room, you probably don't need as much light to sign onto your sensors to get an idea of what's going on. That's what's causing this nice look inside of your eye. Then into a crystalline lens. This is the adjustable one that's allowing you to focus on different things, right? Notice when you close one eye, you still have some depth perception, right? If you look at your hand, the stuff behind it looks fuzzy. And that's uh, because of the, the crystalline lens here, which can bend in response to what you want to look at. Uh, then finally, it goes through a bunch of goo and hits the back of your eye, which is the retina, which is kind of like the sensor inside of your camera. By the way, no, remember we talked about uh, pinhole cameras and, and one of the things that we noticed was that the image is actually upside down when we look at the pinhole camera. And of course, that's exactly what's going on inside of your eye, right? The light rays are crossing each other when they go through the lens. And so actually what you're sensing is an upside down view of the world, but conveniently your brain could care less, right? That's uh, just the way that it's wired, right? And so basically from there, uh, you have this big cable, otherwise known as your optic nerve, which is communicating all this signal to your brain. So from a computer science perspective, what's going on here is you just have a giant, basically piece of hardware, whose job in life is to take in light and convert it into a chemical signal. And it is remarkably effective at what it does. Yeah, so, so really, you know, a lot of the things in front are just like lens systems. And then the one last piece that's a little bit interesting and worth examining uh, uh, more, of course, if you take, you know, an actual vision course, it's all worth examining, um, is, is the, the retina on the back of your eye to understand how we're, we're perceiving color and so on. Okay, so let's think about this for a minute. So uh, the next question you might ask is, well, what sensors do we actually have that, that receive that light and convert it into the chemical signal? And there's two different types. I always confuse these two, and I likely will throughout today's lecture. I'll use them interchangeably, and even though they totally shouldn't be. Uh, one is rods, and one is uh, cones. So you have uh, rods, which are sensitive just to light energy. They're just telling you, is there bright stuff or not? Right? They're not sensitive to color. And then you have cones, which are like kind of the fine-grained dental, dental instrument of the, of the eyeball world, uh, which are sensitive uh, to different gradations of color rather than just brightness. Right? And so really when you look at an image of the world, um, it's kind of amazing that what you're perceiving in front of you is this very coherent kind of continuous picture with color assigned kind of uniformly. Like I don't think that you perceive, for example, that you have more rods, right? You're more sensitive just to brightness and darkness than you are to changes in color, although of course there are all kinds of clever kind of optical illusions that are uh, designed to expose that kind of structure. Right? And it totally makes sense that you're more sensitive to light energy, right? I, I mean, in some sense, color is a useful signal, but like, is a thing charging at me at 90 miles an hour is the kind of thing that you can get just with brightness, and that's probably the sensor that you want going really, really efficiently and with lots of detail. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, so. <laughs> Oh, is that is like a clap-on kind of thing? Huh. Fascinating. Okay, so, uh, right, so, so, so your rods are uh, particularly dominant when you uh, are in low light vision. That makes sense. The next time you're in a dark room, look around you and see how much color you see. Um, and, and when you start to have lots of light around you, then uh, your cones uh, become more useful. And so this is the difference between scotopic and photopic vision. Um, and there are many different uh, ways that you can understand the distinction between basically these two pieces of hardware, right? Yet another one is that um, your rods tend to be kind of a little bit slow response and the cones a little bit faster response because they're kind of designed for that interesting detail right in front of you. So in this class, we're not going to focus, thank God, on anatomy. <laughs> but uh, even here, it's important to step back and remember that when we talk about graphics algorithms, displays, and so on, they're not, you know, it's, when you take algorithms class, you take, what, 006 or whatever it is, 
right? Your job in life is to like just count operations and be done with it. Here, uh, there's a very fuzzy axis which is measuring success, and and basically your client is appealing to this very noisy, weird piece of hardware, and you can do all kinds of things that make your algorithm faster and give you arguably an incorrect result, but because your eye can't see it, you know, what difference does it make? So like, here's a good example. Um, image processing, let's say I want to like blur out a photograph or whatever, right? So if, if you go take a signal processing course on the double E side of our department, you spend lots of time talking about convolution and all that good stuff. And of course, uh, those things are expensive computationally, right? Like if I want to convolve an image, I got to do lots of arithmetic. Um, or where this becomes even more important, you know, if you play with Photoshop, sometimes you can like blur out an image, but you want to preserve the sharp edges and so on. Right, so these are image filters that are a little more complicated to evaluate. They require iterating over the pixels and doing some, some funny stuff. Here's the thing. Remember that your eye is much more sensitive to brightness than it is to color, right? So here's a, a quick trick to make your algorithm three times faster. And indeed, some graphics shaders really do this, um, which is, okay, so... I could apply my image filter to the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel in my image, right? So if it takes time t to process one channel, then it takes time 3t to process all three. I think we could all agree on that. Um, but a common trick here is actually to take your image, convert it into one of these representations like HSV, where the brightness is separated off from the color. Just apply your image filter to the brightness and then convert it back. And oftentimes your eye can't perceive the difference. So here's a screenshot actually from one of my old research papers. So this was a photo of a tractor that we wanted to blur out in an edge preserving way. This is a pretty expensive computation to do. And uh, if you zoom in real close to the pixels here, we're going to do a lot of this today. You can notice that there's actually a lot of high frequency information here, but it's only in the color channel. And the, the reason is that what we did is we converted it to brightness and then everything else. We just blurred out the brightness channel and then we glued it all back together. And it's actually quite difficult to perceive the fact that there's high frequency color information in this image. Now, if you get right up in its, in its business, you can, absolutely. But if these things are going by at 30 frames a second, then you, know, you can squeeze out two thirds of your computation time uh, with, with very little uh, change perceptually, which is pretty nice. Yeah? So was the original image like what did it look like kind of thing? Yes, yeah, it's a picture of a tractor. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a different question, which is how do we do this image filter? And I'm happy to tell you about that offline. But um, yeah, uh, so anyway, uh, that's the kind of a, a magic thing here. But, the, but the, the main takeaway is a, this is an expensive computation. You can either do it on red, green, and blue, or just on brightness and leave the rest of it alone. And it's actually very hard to see the difference. It's a little surprising. So there's all kinds of fun facts. You can spend like an entire course talking about the structure of your eye and all the crazy things that are going on inside of there. Um, one of the kind of interesting things, your eye, again, remember, has rods and cones, and of course, distributed in different ways. So the rods are kind of on the outside, the cones are, are right in the middle of your, your, your uh, sort of visual sensory area here. What else do you notice? There's a hole. <laughs> yeah, there's actually a gap between your rods and your cones, right in the center of your vision. Um, and, and so really, you know, the, this is a, t a totally amazing thing that your brain is just filling in missing signal, right? It's inferring color where there isn't any on the outside of your field of view. It's inferring content where there's a giant hole in your vision and you just can't see any of that because your brain works really, really, really fast. Yeah, and it's just amazing. Um, and, and there really are implications for, for display technology of, of these sorts of ideas. Do you guys think of some? Like, what, what, how could I use this, this kind of fact to, to help make a better display? Itching to answer. Yeah. You can just not render that part well at all. What was that? The, the blind spot in your vision, if you know where the user is looking at, you can just not render it. Yeah, if I know where you're looking and I know you have a blind spot here, I don't have to render it. Your brain will, fill, your brain will do the rendering for you. That's absolutely right. Any other ideas? There's many. This is, you know, open ended thing. Yeah, so that's actually a pretty good one. Um, so here's uh, an example. This is a thing that was very popular in the 80s and 90s and, and kind of went away. Um, was to make something called an attentive display, where what you would do is you'd try to figure out where somebody was looking, and you say, okay, well, remember that your eye is only sensitive to detail right in the center, and so maybe I put all of my rendering algorithm work in rendering just that stuff that's right where I think that your eye is focused, and then on the outside I just do some bad version of your rendering, and they have all these crazy experiments that show people often can't perceive the, uh, the difference. Why do you think you don't have this in, in most modern displays? 
eye tracking, exactly. The latency of tracking your eye is often slower than the display technology. And that makes this super frustrating in practice, right? You change your gaze, and then a fraction of a second later, the detail changes, it means that you, you just brought this person out of their virtual world just long enough to make this a pretty useless technology. However, that's beginning to change, right? Because eye tracking technology is getting a lot better than it used to be. Uh, and some people are just starting to revisit some of these ideas now that we have fast VR and so on. Yep. Is this worthless if two people are looking at the screen at the same time? It is worthless if two people are looking at the screen at the same time because then you don't know, you know, I guess you could do something totally crazy and add detail in multiple places, but I've, I've certainly never seen that in practice. Yeah? It's like a little bit offset for the center. Yeah. It makes sense. So essentially, like, what's going on is you have rods and cones and you transition from one to the other, and there's like a little bit of space there. This is my understanding. Not, not, not a doctor. Well, I am a doctor, but not, not, not that guy. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, right. So let's, uh, let's talk a little more about your cones. So your cones are the part of your eye that's sensitive to color. Uh, and as many of you probably know, we have three types. M mostly have three types, not everybody. Um, but the vast majority of humans have uh, cones that are, uh, have, have sensitivity curves that look like this, right? So there's S, M, and L for short, medium, and long, which refers to the wavelength. Uh, does anybody remember what the left side of this spectrum is? What color? Blue, that's right. So you've got one kind of kind of crazy type of uh, cone here, all the way in the blue area, and then two here, right, which are sensitive to red and green. I forget what order. I guess it would be green and then red, right, because very GB biv goes that way. Um, there's a lot of kind of interesting things to observe about this plot here, right? Uh, in particular, you know, we talk when we when we talk about RGB displays, we think of them like three colors that we're manipulating. They're somehow like linearly independent. But that's really not true. Like your sensor in your eye, which is sensitive to red, and your sensor, which is sensitive to green, have a ton of overlap in terms of the spectra that they tend to see. And then like way over here on the side is this other guy, which is sensitive to blue. Uh, and this can create some really interesting visual artifacts that we'll, we'll, we'll dive into a bit. Moreover, not only are these sensitive to different wavelengths that overlap, which is already a little frustrating, but their, uh, their distribution uh, is not uniform. So in particular, you have about 150 red sensors to every 100 green sensors to every one blue sensor. So let's think for a minute both about sensing technology like cameras and about displays. So what, what does this mean for my, my camera? So uh, I'll give you a hint. So, so most cameras actually only have sensors for brightness. They don't have sensors for color. This is a little bit less true now, but, but often what you would do is you have a brightness sensor and then you put like a little filter in front of it that, that would just filter out red, green, or blue light. What should I do with my, my camera, uh, leveraging this fact that my eye is much more sensitive to red light than other colors? Yeah? I mean, when you record the brightness of the scene, then you can record much more detail on the red. So you can get much more space converted to red. Exactly, right? You, you have much more sensitivity to red, green, uh, to red uh, then to green, then to blue, right? And so in particular, um, if you look, right, there's something called a Bayer sensor, which is inside of, or a Bayer filter rather, which is inside of your camera. So your camera has a bunch of pixels, right? And the pixels are just sensitive to brightness. And then you put like little, like, you know, colored lenses in front of each one uh, to, to sense a different color. So maybe what I should do is put two red, one green, and one blue, it would be one very simple approximation that's going to make my camera two times as high, uh, as, as sensitive to red color as to green and to blue. And the reason that people do these kinds of things is to uh, align with the way that you perceive uh, uh, color. Does that make sense? And of course, there are many different uh, camera sensors out that, that, that use different filters for light and so on. Now let's think in terms of, 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 of sensing. What does this imply about your, your, your eye's sensitivity? Like, do you notice differences in color in every day and your, your sensitivity? For the most part, probably not. But there's one company that I think made a huge mistake when they were choosing their logo, and that's Walmart. <laughs> so you guys might know that, that Walmart has, what, a blue logo, like a little yellow star on the top. And oftentimes when you're driving at night, you know, the, the point of Walmart is to be this big shining beacon on the side of the highway. Um, there's a big problem, which is when you look, the next time you're driving on the highway, or rather when your, your colleague is driving on the highway and you are in a safe passenger seat, Take a look at the road signs when it's dark out, and what you'll see is the, the signs which are blue and neon tend to look very fuzzy, 
and signs that are red and neon tend to be very sharp. And this isn't that like somehow you're having a focus issue or that like blue is harder to focus on or something. It's that you just have fewer blue sensors, right? So that, that blue image that you're seeing is like kind of inferring a lot of color that isn't there that the, the red sensors don't have to do because there's more of them. Uh, and so if you're ever designing your company logo and you think you're going to have a big sign on the side of the highway, you should definitely make it out of red or green rather than blue uh, because people won't see it. It just looks blurry at a distance. Um, yeah, uh, and if you look, for example, at highway signs, right, that are telling you like what highway you're on and so on, many of them are designed very carefully to make the most contrast possible, right, because that's the kind of vision that you need to do very quickly. Okay, so that's our, our basic anatomical setup, and, and, and thankfully I'm, I'm done talking about that, that piece of the puzzle here. Um, so now let's talk about how we actually measure how people perceive light. So the first thing we have to do is come up with a mathematical model, which is everybody's favorite thing to do. Um, so, so here's what this looks like. So remember that we've seen these curves so far, which are telling you the sensitivity of your cones as sort of a function of where you are in this, the spectrum. So in other words, like if I had a pure kind of teal-ish light, I would have this much sensitivity, which is lower than if I had this shade of green, right? So now I have a, you know, some light, some electromagnetic energy comes in, and it has its own spectrum, right? So that's also another plot like that, right? So this is what we call the power, di uh, power diagram. Now that, that's the computational geometry thing. The power distribution, uh, uh, which is telling me that I have kind of orange light, right? It's kind of peaked in the red yellow region here. So if I want to measure how much of this orange light my green cone sees, <laughs> what do I do? I multiply them, that'll give me a plot, but your green cone is just like this, this, this kind of, you know, bludgeon of an instrument. It doesn't, it doesn't like tell you a distribution, it just tells you a number. So after I multiply them, I get some function that'll probably look like this. And then what do I do? I take the integral, that's right. So the total amount that I see, I multiply the power distribution of the light with the sensitivity of my eye, and I take the integral, if you don't like integral, I sum, <laughs> uh, and that's, and that's uh, what I perceive, right? And so really you can think of the multiplication as just measuring kind of overlap. Remember, this is exactly the same story as when we were talking about Fourier analysis, right? When we wanted to kind of measure how much of a frequency was inside of uh, a function, in that case, like a, you know, a graphics function, we took the dot product with the frequency and, and, and that's what we found. And so that's exactly what's going on here, right? This is some notion of a dot product. And in fact, it's no mistake that we actually talk about light in terms of wavelength and, and frequency, right? There really is Fourier hiding in there, but that's, that's something for a different class. Okay, so if at the end of the day, I mean, it's sort of disappointing, right? Like there's all this color out there in the universe. I mean, we're always showing you these like beautiful rainbow plot things, but then the reality is that like three numbers come in at every point in your eye. It doesn't actually give you this plot. What it gives you is just how excited your short, medium, and long cones are at every point, which is not color. Color is this whole spectrum here, right? So the reality is that there's this cool function out there, phi, which is the distribution over all the possible nanometers of, of how much light is out there. And unfortunately, your eye doesn't observe phi, it just observes these three numbers, which are the dot product of phi with these three sensitivity curves. Does that make sense? Notice that no matter what we do in this course, it all ends up being linear algebra at the end of the day, right? This is just another dot product. Okay. Right, so we have the power distribution the uh, sensitivity and what comes out are three numbers that are known as the tri-stimulus values, which is just how excited your three uh, cones are to uh, a particular uh, electromagnetic distribution. Does that story make sense so far? Yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, incidentally, if you don't like this integral story, a different way to think about it is that your cones are kind of like row vectors and the spectrum of light is kind of like a column vector, right? So what you observe is the dot products between like your cone spectral response and the spectrum that's in the light. These are all just different versions of the same story here. But the, the, the basic takeaway so far, which is kind of funny, is that there's an infinite number of wavelengths out there, but we actually only see three numbers. This classroom is just a mystery. Um, okay, so, Right, so <laughs> this is weirdly, weirdly distracting. Um, okay, so, so right, so, so in other words, 
Yeah, this is a guy. It's time for lunch, guy. Should we get down? <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah, I've got a lot. It's coming out of the physics lab. I just shudder to think. Okay. All right. So right. So. So the basic takeaway so far is your cones are not just detectors of one wavelength. Like we often talk about green as like however many nanometers, but rather they're, they're really, they're fuzzy objects that detect a whole range of wavelengths and superpositions of them and so on. Uh, and and those, are, those are these tristimulus values. Okay, so right. What does that imply? So the space of light color distributions out there is infinite dimensional. Right? There's a lot of different distributions I could put on the color space. You only get three numbers. If you're taking a linear algebra class, we're like projecting from a very high dimensional space into a three dimensional space. Can we invert that matrix? No, right? That is a wide and short matrix. It's the story of my life. And uh, what that means is that there are multiple colors that probably look the same. And that's because we're not seeing the actual distributions, we're just seeing those, those projections. And those colors are called metamers, right? So these are spectral compositions that create the same tristimulus values. And this is essentially what all of your display technology is built on. Do you see that? Because what does your computer screen do? Does it have like this cool instrument in it that can like control wavelengths of light and produce all the different ones you could want? No, it just has a brightness control and then red, green, and blue filters in front of it. And the reason is that it's never showing you the actual distribution of light that you probably captured in a photograph. What it's showing you is a metamer to what you saw because you're not going to be able to see the difference anyway. Yeah? And so that's really what's going on inside of all these things. That we, can, we can stimulate your eyeballs the same way that whatever scene in front of you does by just messing with, those, with, with three different colors. And, and that's what's going on inside of your display technology. Now, is that 100% true? The answer is going to be no. We're going to find that there's colors out there that your display might not be able to capture. Which we, we kind of know, like if you go to Best Buy, they often they'll show you like those little diagrams that show you kind of what colors you can see and what you can't in a given TV. Um, and that has to do with the fact that like, what could go wrong in our linear algebra story? Like let's say I could invert this matrix. Well, there's a detail here, which is like linear algebra doesn't care about positive versus negative numbers, right? And, and so if it turns out that when I compute my metamer, I need negative value, then I'm in trouble, right? So, so that's, that's essentially what's going to go wrong. Okay, so metamorism is this phenomenon that like we can see, essentially we can perceive the same color even though really these two, two things are giving out different spectra. Um, one way to see that is that when materials are metamors, then you have to pair the material with the light source, right? Like for instance, let's say that I have, uh, <laughs> I don't know, a really weird species of apple that's red, but only like reflects out one wavelength of red light. It's a very red apple, and similarly a green apple. Well, those two apples are metamers under a blue light because right, they just look black, yeah? Um, but of course, if I put a different light bulb there, that won't be the case. Um, and this is a phenomenon that, that many people have experienced. So sometimes like you'll choose, you know, an outfit that tends to match under the neon lights in TJ Maxx, and then you bring it home, and you have this nice warm house lighting, or you fashion your clothes outside or whatever, and no longer do they match because your light source is different uh, and, and that's causing a different kind of perceptual phenomenon. Yeah? Um, so in other words, context really, really matters when you're talking about color perception. That it's not just a material property, it's a property of your eyeball, the material, and the light source all working together. Yeah? There's like a cool YouTube experiment about like underwater, this happens too. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I don't know about uh, underwater, um, but speaking of YouTube phenomenon, here's a good example. So, of course, uh, many of us uh, uh, perceive uh, light based on context, and when we remove the context, that's one of these causes where your visual system really struggles to perceive um, the correct uh, signal here. It is really obviously blue and black. I don't understand. So, just out of curiosity, how many of you guys see this dress as blue and black? Anybody as white and gold? You guys are ridiculous. You're just you're just wrong. Um, but in any event, this is somehow like like maximally ambiguous photograph where this dress is taken in this weird lighting uh, uh, condition, which is is kind of hard to perceive from the photograph. And so, depending on how you perceive the context of the dress, you might uh, guess that it's blue and black, or white and gold, or somewhere in between. Uh, you know, and this caused a big uh, rift between Taylor Swift and Kim Kardashian, which of course is uh, problematic in our our everyday life. 
Okay. So, uh, right. So here's our, our big uh, picture so far, right, is that uh, essentially, once again, just like when we talked about transformations, just like when we talked about splines, just like we talked about skinning, everything else, the animation, it's just another way, excuse to do linear algebra, but there are two added twists here that we haven't encountered so much in this course. One is that our basis is like not a little bit not orthogonal. How can I, let, me, let me try that again. Our basis isn't orthogonal. <laughs> it's far from it, uh, right? And, and here our basis being, you know, your sensitivity of, of the different types of rods, your cones rather. And um, moreover, you've got infinite dimensional things getting projected down into a low dimensional space. Our matrices aren't square. And we can't add negative lights. We can't get every possible linear combination, only the ones in the kind of positive orthon. Yeah, so this is what's going to make our life a little bit harder in color science than it has been in some of the linear algebra we've done and you all so capably did on your, your midterms. Okay, sorry, your quizzes. Right, so uh, a, a couple other phenomena that are worth noting. Um, not everybody has exactly this uh, setup, right? So oftentimes uh, a, a pretty common affliction is color blindness, uh, where you're missing one or more type of cone. So for example, maybe you're not uh, sensitive to red light. Uh, and of course that means that people with, with that species of, of color blindness likely have more metamers than other people. There's also, I think, a rare phenomenon where people have more types of cones than three. Um, I certainly don't experience that. It seems to be slightly more predominant in, in, in males and females, and it's a kind of a genetic linked trait. Uh, so uh, typically, in case you've never seen before, uh, the, the kind of test that they have for colorblindness, we will not do a survey in this course. Um, what they'll do is, is they'll make use of this idea of a metamer by drawing a particular pattern out of color and then embedding within it a digit. So there's a three there, in case you're wondering. Uh, but the digit is written in such a way that if you're colorblind, they're, they're both metamers of one another and you can't perceive uh, uh, the, the differences between the colors. So anyway, if, if, <laughs> if you weren't sure if you were colorblind or not, you can take the slides home and, and give it a shot. Um, and of course, these things are, have become more and more tricky. There's also sort of an interesting reverse one. I swear, there's like a science experiment going on right outside of the door of this classroom. And Okay. Uh, <laughs> right, so if, if you are colorblind, um, then kind of a funny thing can happen here where the contrast uh, actually gets higher and you can see like a snake embedded in this image where if you're not, then, then you can't. So like here, uh, essentially all the interesting signal is happening in the brightness, but not if you add this other channel that out overpowers it. Um, so if you just mask out the uh, intensities here, you can see the embedded pattern there. Um, in fact, kind of, here's kind of a cool example where there's a, a, a painter who the theory is that he likely was colorblind, and so the combinations of colors that are inside of the paintings are sort of uncommon if you perceive the full color spectrum. But if you don't, then it looks like what he probably perceived as the outdoors, which is pretty cool. Okay, um, so, so far we've talked about analysis, right? Just like how your eye works and how to describe it. Uh, and of course, we should also talk about synthesis, which is that you have a display in front of you. Many of you are paying much closer attention to those to class. Uh, and, and we might want to reproduce color on your display so that you perceive whatever scene you sensed uh, with your camera, which I think is a pretty sort of obvious problem that we need to solve, uh, and actually quite challenging to do, and, and requires a little bit more thinking than we might be used to. Um, so in particular, we have this kind of funny universe where we only have three colors of paint, red, green, and blue, uh, and we're trying to reproduce all of these different colors that maybe your camera sensed. And, and this is really a, a tricky matter because it, it understands, if you really want to do it properly, which if you work in an art, uh, art studio or one of these calibrated display places, you'll, you'll spend quite a bit of time worrying about is the fact that you need to know so much information. You need to know the response curve of your camera. You need to know the response curve of your, or rather your, your, the energy curve of your display. You need to know the response curve of your eye, where your viewer is sitting, what they're likely to be looking at, uh, and of course, Typically, we only do very, very coarse approximations of these things. So first, let me tell you the wrong way to go about this, uh, which is as follows. So let's say that I have red, green, and blue displays, right? So I, and I know, they're, they're, I know the energy spectrum that comes out of those three uh, types of, of, of color. Well, one thing I could do would be say, okay, well, I've got this like little green you know, piece of transparent material I'm going to put in front of a light bulb display eventually. So I'm going to just put that thing in front of my camera, 
right? And then sense the intensity and then do the same thing with a red, you know, sheet of plastic and then a blue sheet of plastic. That gives me three numbers, which are the intensity of red, green, and blue. And now I'm just going to use those three numbers and display them back out. What do we think? Does that strategy work? Does that, does that end up reproducing the color that I wanted? It kind of feels like it should, right? Like I just sensed red, green, and blue, and now I'm going to put red, green, and blue back out. But the answer is actually no. And the reason is that we're confusing a matrix in its inverse. Yeah? So when I, when I want to display, what do I have to do? I have to invert my eye's sensor in order to produce colors that, that give me the sensory information that I need. That is not the same as just taking the dot product uh, with the sensors of the incoming light. And so in particular, this sort of idea of additive synthesis by just measuring this dot product really doesn't work. So here's, here's an example. So let's say I have this uh, you know, magenta colored light. So I, I sense the color and, and what I get is this kind of bluish thing. Right? And why, what's the reality here? Well, when I display this color on my screen, I got basically 100% blue and no green or red. So when I display back out, if I just scale with that same number, I'm just going to see blue. The reason, is, the reason is that, you know, even though I'm in the tails of this thing, I am exciting these, these, these guys, and I actually may have to put more in that, that part of the, the spectrum to kind of compensate for the fact that they're not very sensitive to that particular region. Um, so this is uh, sometimes called pollution. And, and, and the, the, the basic issue here is that spectra are infinite dimensional and non-orthogonal. It's just basically a total nightmare out there to do properly. Yeah? Uh, all right, so instead of doing that, we have to be quite careful, right? So in particular, uh, what can we do? Well, uh, remember that your tri-stimulus values, right? You can think about it as like just a giant matrix you know, that's the picture you should have in mind <laughs> for today's lecture, right? One wide guy with three rows. This is your eyeball. This is light. And that's what goes in, right? And so what you get out are, you know, these, these numbers that you're sensitive to. And now the question is, so this is like M1, right? So you have M1 times the spectrum, and that gives you some vector V, which is the tristimulus values, right? Well, now what am I trying to do? Well, now I have kind of a different scenario, which is I have my display, which just creates three colors, but in a potentially different way, right? They, they could be metamers. They, they don't have anything to do with these three rows. So I have some other M2. This time it's square, because there really are just red, green, and blue displays out there that I'm trying to control, right? And I'm trying to fo solve the following, which is that, right? Which is saying, how much should I turn on or off the display lights so that I replicate the same tristimulus values that I got when I read off the spectra? And the basic issue that, that we've been talking about is that these two matrices are not the same. Right? This one comes from your, uh, your eyeball right, and your sensitivity. This guy comes from your eyeball sensitivity, but also the light that's being emitted by your display. And moreover, you've got to invert. So anyway, um, that's, that's the basic uh, matter here. And the kind of funny thing is if you look at the early experiments that people did to try and understand color spaces, they basically, they didn't know it, but they were doing Gaussian elimination by hand. Uh, and we'll see what, what the, the, that looks like in just a second. Um, so all this is to say that we often need kind of principled color spaces, right? And there's many representations of color and nobody can agree on the right ones. Like should they be color, which is the brightness of your display? Should it be the sensitivity of your eye, well, the latter might be somehow more intuitive, but the problem is that every time you want to display it on your screen, you're going to have to do some calculation to convert it into what your display needs, right? which maybe isn't so good. Um, the good news is that often these things are all just linked by three by three matrices. Uh, so at the end of the day, it's not terribly difficult. So the most standard color space uh, is something called C, uh, C I E X Y Z. So the X Y Z stand for the coordinates of your color space. It's roughly red, green, and blue. Um, and, and they're kind of like the tristimulus values in your eye. CIE stands for some fancy French organization, which is the first people to propose this particular system. And of course, uh, the, basic, the basic issue here that the CIE, which I will not attempt to pronounce, um, was running into is that, you know, it's very hard to measure the sensitivity of your cones directly for any number of reasons. I mean, for one, you'd have to scoop it out of your eyeball. Um, for another, even if you did, it's, it's not clear how you would design an experiment that like got these curves in a nice way. 
Now, of course, since then, people have come up with, with plenty of ways to do it, but the CIE in the 1920s, in a relatively ethical organization, didn't, didn't do anything too crazy. So instead, they did a really clever experiment. And that's as follows. So, you make a light, which is of a prescribed wavelength, so just one, right? And now, what I'm going to do to figure out not just the sensitivity of my curve, but actually maybe I have a computer screen which is composed of these three light bulbs. So at the end of the day, I don't really care about the actual spectrum inside of this light. I just care about what lights to turn on to replicate it. And so they would do this experiment that said, okay, you can sit here and turn three knobs and control the brightness of these three light bulbs. So just go ahead and do that until the, the color that you get on the left-hand side matches the color that we're displaying to you on the right. Yeah? And so if you think about it, really what they were doing was solving a linear algebra problem by having this person use knobs to invert a matrix, which is kind of funny. Um, but in any event, what they found, so when you do that, what's going to be the issue? Well, for the most part, you can, you can accomplish this. Right? But then every once in a while, I show you a light that you just can't reproduce with these three colors because in your linear algebra here, you would need like a negative number somewhere. Right? And then the user would just say, sorry, I give up. Yeah. There absolutely are, yeah. In fact, your printer probably does too, right? You have a CMYK, but you don't really need a K, right? Um, yeah. But in any event, what the CIE found is that there's roughly three primary colors of light so that for all those other wavelengths, this was, these are the three that kind of spanned it, meaning that if I can display these three colors, then there exist different knobs I could turn that basically reproduce all the other wavelengths of color that I can see out there. Um, there's still a few that you can't. So in particular, uh, here's kind of a funny thing you can do. So uh, essentially, what, what is the problem they're solving here? So we choose a wavelength. Now the question is, how bright or dark should I switch each of those light bulbs to be so that your eye perceives that combination of these specific three wavelengths as the same as this other wavelength? And for the most part, it's positive. And this is a linear algebra problem, just comes from this kind of calculation. So the most part, it's positive, but there's this little region here where it dips below negative. And what does that mean? That means try as you might, you can make those li lights as bright or as dark as you want, you will never find a combination of knobs that produces this particular wavelength using that display technology. Now, as Colton suggests, there's a totally reasonable solution to this problem, which is what people do, which is to say, okay, well, then maybe I want to add another light bulb whose primary is around here. And that's perfectly fine. In fact, what that'll do, which is kind of funny, I mean, your eye is this three-dimensional projection. Now you have four things, so there are often like many different ways you could display the same color on a display like that. So then you might ask different things like crispness, like maybe, you know, you have different numbers of red, green, and blue cones. You can choose to display a color in the place that your eye is most sensitive to, for example. Um, it, things get arbitrarily complicated. Now, most of us don't do that. Most of us have displays with three colors. And so you have to cope with this, this crazy idea and, and the basic issue or the, the basic solution that CIE came up with which is pretty brain dead is to just kind of raise the whole distribution of light and what they found was perceptually I mean what are you doing you're kind of desaturating your color a little bit at that point um, but that's often good enough and, and that's roughly what your display technology does okay so uh, what's our, our recap so far spectra are infinite dimensional cones are three-dimensional, and you're projecting from that space into that second space, which means there's a lot of wiggle room, and that's essentially what we're leveraging in all of our, our technology. And so in the CIE, they chose kind of three colors, where these were primary colors of light that I could tune in such a way that I could reproduce almost all the rest of the, the spectrum using just this nice linear algebra trick without uh, negative numbers, which is essentially what you need. And this is just engineering. Like, there, there, there are many other options here. This is just the sort of standard that was developed in the 1920s, which of course is far before we even had control over displays, so probably we do a better job now, and in fact many organizations do. Any questions so far? Kind of a nice story. Yeah? Is that where the whole HDR thing came in, it just gives us a better business? Uh, yeah, so let's, in fact, let's explore that a little bit. Um, right, so I know, I'll skip over. Yeah, so at the, at the end of the day, when you, when you see a lot of these displays, for example in HDR and so on, um, what you end up seeing are these diagrams that look like this. Okay, these are the chromaticity diagrams. And so your display is what? Like, so if I have three um, primary colors of light, it's like three points here. And then all the colors that I can see, they're kind of like weighted averages of those three things. By the way, in here, notice that this is a two-dimensional thing, because what they've done is removed 
the length, like just brightness. And so, yeah, so typically what happens when you have a display is you have some number of primaries that are points here, and then the colors that are displayable are inside of the convex hull, right? So in some of these HDR displays and so on, what they did is they tried to choose primaries that are kind of farther out so that you can basically cover a bigger piece of this object. I don't know exactly what's going on inside of that, that particular technology, um, but that's what's going on here. And so this is called a chromaticity diagram because essentially, notice that my two coordinates, I've just divided by the sum of my tristimulus values, so, which is just brightness. Uh, and, and that's what we're plotting here. So for example, um, here's the CIE primary, and you can see, by the way, I think this diagram came later, like historically speaking, they kind of guessed these three primaries. But they did a good job, right? So if this is the full kind of visible spectrum in XYZ or XY uh, coordinates, they've covered about as big a triangle as you could get. I guess maybe you can move the vertex in a little bit, whatever. Um, so basically what this is saying is in order to reproduce color here, that's the places you need those negative weights. Yeah, the question or is that? Ah, excellent. Right, and so um, in general, if I have a display, I can describe it in a nice distinct way by like showing this full visible spectrum. Of course, the irony is that this projector itself has some, you know, piece of the spectrum it can display. So there's like a big constant region over here, which is just because your, your projector is not doing a good job. Uh, but in any event, uh, this diagram where you've embedded in the vertices of your display um, is basically trying to capture something called the gamut of your display, which is the set of colors that you can represent using a particular device. That makes sense? So like the gamut is that triangle which is embedded inside of this horseshoe shape which is all the visible uh, uh, shades of light. So for example, here's the HDTV uh, sort of gamut. Um, <laughs> here's my favorite gamut which is the crayon gamut. Notice that it is discrete because it would be hard to melt together crayons and make a new color. Uh, and, and so essentially uh, this is what happened. So, so like you were asking about what, what could happen if I had more than three primaries. Well, essentially, I would just be adding more points to this diagram, right? So I could even like trace out the entire outside of this curve if I wanted to. But the issue is going to be that it's now not unique in order to represent any given color. Uh, and moreover, you know, what are these displays? Well, they're like little tilings of the different colors on your screen. And so now, uh, you know, if you look at per unit area, how many of any one color there is, it's less, right? Because there's a conservation law. Uh, and so I think that's why people don't typically do that, although there's some specialized displays, like maybe you really care about high precision in the blue part of the spectrum or something, um, where, where maybe you'd want to do that. Okay, um, of course there are many other color spaces, right? The, so the XYZ one is kind of nice because it's correlated with the tristimulus values, that's what they were aiming for. Um, but there are other ones that are useful. Uh, so for example, there's LAB. So LAB, a lot of these were designed kind of half by artists and half by scientists and, and a little bit of A, a little, little from column A, a little from column B. So in LAB uh, color space, um, or L star, A star, B star, essentially there's one axis which is luminance, which is just controlling like, the brightness, and then two that are controlling color. Um, another one which is pretty popular, which was kind of engineered, uh, is uh, HSV or sometimes HSL, which is hue, saturation, and value. Right? And so the saturation is somehow, um, you know, how much color it is relative to just white at the center. The value goes from black to kind of full color. Uh, and the hue, for whatever reason, I actually am not totally sure, maybe you guys know, um, was mapped onto a circle, which is a little odd if you think about it, because wavelengths aren't circular, right? So, so somewhere on here there's like a big jump from red back to uh, uh, blue, right? Um, which happens, and, and somehow people like this. I think there's like an opponency thing, like there's all this theory about complementary colors they wanted on opposite sides. Yeah? Yeah, I don't know if it's true, and I'm mm. But I, I like, read that mm. the like, the hue of the light is different. That would have to be right, right? Because, um, well, I don't know. Yeah, like at some point you're going to have to like make this really fast move across the color spectrum back to red. Uh, so presumably somewhere in this color wheel there's like a weird cut that happens, but I, I don't know how to interpret it. Yeah, I, I should do some more reading. I, I, this is a weird color space to me, but it, it is a popular one. Who knows? Um, right, so another uh, popular color space, which of course is important in your, your printer, is something called CMYK. So, 
Let's see here. So what does CMYK stand for? Cyan, magenta, yellow, black. Why do we care about those colors? So what's the difference between your printer and a display? <laughs> Start there. Yeah. Messy brown. Or black if you had enough uh, colors around. Um, yeah, so th that's absolutely right. So, so your printer ink does the opposite of what a computer screen does. Right? So what does a computer screen do? When I want color, I produce it, right? There's light coming out. Well, a printer is somehow the world's you know, most passive display. Uh, what is it doing? Well, when I put ink on the page, the page by default is white, right? It just reflects all the color back out, right? So when I add ink, ink is basically a chemical which is absorbing light. Right? And so when I choose my primaries, I don't want it to be red, because what does red ink mean? It means that it is absorbing everything except for red. Right? That's what red ink would be. In other words, it's letting the red light bounce off. Everything else is now sucking in to the chemical that wasn't there before. So why do I choose CMYK? Well, what I do is I take red and I look at everything. If I wanted to have... Um, a primary that I'd like to subtract as little light as possible every time I add these three colors. Right? And so that's what these are. These are subtractive primaries so that when I put them all together I get black because I'm blocking light rather than adding it. Right? So this is just kind of working from white back down instead of from black up. Right? Uh, now there's, there's a, di a different question here. So CM and Y make sense as primaries. Why does your printer have K? What's the one thing that's like really frustrating to me that it's not B, but uh, that aside, why, why do I have a bl uh, black ink in my printer? Yeah. That's right. So what is the main thing that people print? Text. Yeah, black and white text. So why use three canisters of ink to reproduce black and white text when you can just use, you know, an additional cartridge of, of black, which is usually the one that you run out of first anyway. Um, so, so technically you probably wouldn't need it, except as, as you point out, uh, our primaries aren't exactly right to get exactly black when you put them all together. But uh, the real reason that it's there is that, of course, uh, black is the primary color that we print because we're not very interesting people. Um, moreover, your eye is extremely sensitive to brightness. Right? And so having black ink, even if you're printing a color photograph, your black ink gets used because you can have better control over that brightness aspect, which is the part that you really care about getting right. right? The color, you can get a little wrong and have it bleed, and it's, it's, it's not as big a deal. Does that make sense? Yeah, and so these are, these are your, your, your basic uh, primaries, but because you have um, this black thing, remember we're in a three-dimensional world, right? Your, your eye senses red, green, and blue, but now we have a four-dimensional modality, which means that there are different ways to reproduce the same image. So here uh, we have this nice uh, idyllic uh, collapsing barn scene here, and I can actually render it in two different uh, co combinations of, of CMYK. So here's one version, notice that there's a lot of cyan, a lot of magenta, and a lot of yellow. And here's the second version where we said like any time that I've got a pixel that's like 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, I could put those all at zero and then put a 0.5 in the black instead and have the same effect. Right, so this is called the max black kind of shading of my image, does that make sense? So it like takes the sort of common denominator of the, the, the three uh, primaries, subtracts it off and puts it in the black ink instead. And, and, and why do we do that? It's because this one is most likely to put the best contrast in your image. In fact, you can even kind of see it, right? Like you can see the details of the photograph uh, in, in this image much better uh, than some of the other guys. Yeah? How come in the blue one, the bar is just Yeah, I mean, you tell me. Why does the bar disappear? Oh, isn't that like weird spot that you can actually like, render it in like, not quite. So, so here's your clue. If you look on the left-hand side, you can see the, the barn very clearly. So what's going on? Well, the color here, I mean, what is this color? It's kind of a bluish, reddish color here. Right? So for instance, I think this panel is, should be the, the, the dead giveaway. So this panel is almost black. Right? So in this one, where I'm not allowed to use my black ink, what ends up happening is I have basically 100% of blue, cyan, and yellow. Here, I'm going to absorb all of that in the black, and then what's left over is the white. Right? Because remember, this is subtractive. You have to think backward. Yeah. So I guess what's going on, for example, on the front face of this guy, let's see here, is there is, 
Exactly. So you take kind of the min of these three values, you subtract it off, and you put it in the black, right? So in this case, what it's saying is that the color of this, this barn house is not very blue, but it's more cyan and yellow, right? So even on the right image, I can subtract off all the blue, but then when I subtract off the blue, I still have cyan and yellow left, right? That's, that's what's going on here. That makes sense? It's a good question. Good eye. Yeah, so that's our, our, our picture. It's always worth mentioning printers because it is backward. By the way, printer companies are kind of cool. Like if you go uh, work at one of these places, you'll basically spend your whole time trying to reproduce color really, really carefully. And, and it's, it's kind of an interesting universe because there are a lot of things you have to worry about, right? The, the ink inside of the printer is some complicated chemical. Um, if your print head is moving too quickly, then it'll like, you know, bleed along the page and you have to know about the chemical composition of the ink relative to like the material your paper is made of and all that good stuff. It's just like remarkably kind of cool science going on in places like that. Okay, so our, our, our basic summary so far is, is that it's all about linear algebra. We're just doing lots of matrix multiplies, except in this last case we also have to do some subtraction from the number one. By the way, if you really wanted to do it in linear algebra, I suppose you could using affine stuff, which we talked about. Um, but in any event, the, the sort of standard is this XYZ, but because it requires some extra computation to convert that to your computer screen display, um, I think the standard in terms of just numbers that we store is just red, green, blue, in terms of like how much I should turn on or off each, each pixel. There are a couple other things that are worth mo noting. Um, one is uh, sort of color quantization. So speaking of perceptual things, your eye is really good at noticing ratios of brightness. Meaning that if I have two things right next to each other that are almost the same brightness, but like one is half as bright as the other, so maybe they're like both almost black, but one's more black than the other, your eye will actually perceive that difference, right? Now that's not how your display works, right? I mean your display is like probably linear in, in electrical energy, right? Like if I double the amount of electricity, the, the brightness doubles too. Um, so what does that mean? That means if I have like some number of bits to store color, if I just stored it in terms of like power, like how much I crank that light bulb on or off, perceptually that's actually not such a good idea because what's going to happen is your eye is much more sensitive to differences in dark colors than it is to differences in light colors, right? Because again, you're sensitive to ratios, right? So the difference between one quarter and one half is the same as the distance between one half and one in your eye, in perceptual measure, right? So if I have 250 numbers, 255 numbers to work with, right? Two to the whatever. Should I scale them evenly between 0 and 1? No, I should keep them on a, on a log scale, right? Uh, and that's precisely what goes on. So this is called gamma coding. So you, you might have seen this. You can adjust your gamma on your computer monitor depending on how bright or dark you like your, your displays. And essentially what's going on here is that typically uh, when we store digital images, we don't code them linearly because that would actually lose information from a perceptual perspective. Now, from a wavelength perspective, it might not, but from the perspective of communicating to your eyeball, I should have much more resolution in my color values toward the dark side of the spectrum than toward the light, right? And so the way that you can do that is to store some exponent of color instead of color itself. That exponent is typically 2.2. Um, I always get backward whether it's 2.2 to go from your eye to your screen or from your screen to your eye, but I'll let you guys work out on paper which of those makes sense. Um, but in any event, here's a, an example of what this looks like. So here, what we did is we took even gradations of color in just like computer screen electronic space on the top row. And here we took them in the log space, you know, and then exponentiated. And notice that the bottom one, probably to your eye, looks like kind of an even slide of dark from dark to light. Whereas the top, what, becomes a, a dark, stays dark much, much longer. And you don't really see any interesting contrast over here. Cool. Um, right, so, so uh, this is sort of an important message, which is that your digital images are typically gamma coded. So if you're coding up like your own version of Photoshop, you know, buyer beware. If you'd like to do a piece of computations, you're going to have to do a lot of exps logs very carefully and read the format of your, your image file to make sure that you know, like, is this stored in a perceptual even way or like a, you know, a computer screen even way? And those aren't the same. Okay, so with that, uh, that's the end of our lecture for today and, and the end of our, our color treatment. So the next time I see you, we'll talk about hardware, which terrifies me, but I'll, I'll, I'll study this week. Uh, and uh, yeah, we also have a nano quiz, so don't forget that. And
Your midterm grades should be out in the coming day um, because drop deadline's tomorrow. Hopefully, confirmation from the peers back here by the end of the day. Yeah, um, and then I look forward to receiving your passive e passive aggressive emails. Okay. <laughs>